Good morning, and welcome to Hartwick College's Anderson Theater. Before we begin, we have a few announcements. Today's presentation is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available to view as an archived recording afterwards. You can find out more on our website, hartwick.edu. At this time, we ask you to please silence your cell phones. In the event of an emergency, all exits are clearly marked, either side in the back of the theater and in front on the right side. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Anderson Theater at Hartwick College. I'm Carl Seeley, Professor of Economics and Chair of the Economics Department, and it's my honor to welcome you to this morning's symposium on bridging the urban-rural divide in the United States. Hartwick College takes up the challenge. This is day two of our festivities. We started yesterday with a stimulating discussion between the political strategist David Axelrod and Hartwick's own Professor Laurel Elder. And we're leading into tomorrow's main event, the inauguration of the 11th president of Hartwick College, Mr. Darren Reesberg. And yeah, sure. <laughs> when you're inaugurating a college president, there's something of a tradition of holding a symposium because the Greek roots of the word mean drinking together. So. <laughs> You'll be pleased to note that our panelists have bottles of water, so we met that standard. More substantively, a symposium is when you get together a group of people with interesting things to say to discuss something worth talking about. We've got the folks with interesting things to say. You'll meet them in a moment. And the subject area, originally proposed by President Reesberg, is definitely worth talking about. If you look around the world, in many countries, you see this similar phenomenon that people emerging from urban environments and people with more rural backgrounds tend to diverge in their lived experiences and in their worldviews. And that divergence shows up in culture and it shows up in political developments. We're going to be focusing on this phenomenon in the United States and in particular here at Hartwick. The way this morning is going to go, uh, in just a moment, the panelists will introduce themselves. I'll then put to them a series of questions. They'll discuss amongst themselves those questions. At around noon, we'll, go, we'll open it up to the floor for questions from the audience for 20 or 25 minutes, concluding remarks, and that will be our event. So, uh, Jim. Good morning. Um, I'm Jim Boothman, uh, an associate professor of political science and the current chair of the faculty here at Hartwick. Uh, I study issues of US government and public policy with my area of expertise in environmental and energy policy. Um, I've been integrally involved in the creation and sustenance of our interdisciplinary majors here at Hartwick in environment, sustainability, and society, and in public health. Um, and a year and a half ago, I used my sabbatical to travel the country to explore the relationship between people and nature, um, examining both rural and urban America. And so all of these aspects of my work relates to this divide between urban and rural areas in the United States, uh, which has really become prominent in the last 20 years or so. Good readings, everyone. <laughs> my name is Biyama Charles. My pronouns are she, her. I am originally from Queens, New York, but I have been here at Hartwick College since November 2016. Um, first in the capacity of the Associate Director for Residential Life and Housing. So I supervised the professional staff as well as indirectly the RAs that used to work in all the buildings for about three and a half years. And then I transitioned to this inaugural role as director of our Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging in September 2020. Um, my expertise comes from the fact that I have, again, had a career in both sectors, both in residential life and diversity. Um, 
I also come from an urban area and I am clearly living in a rural town. So I think I can also speak to from that lens. Nice to see all of you. Good morning, I'm Heidi Tanner. I'm the Director of Wellness and Health Promotion here at Hartwick College. Uh, and prior to working here at Hartwick College, um, I have worked as a teacher in both New York State and South Carolina. I've served as an academic reading uh, intervention specialist. I've served as a middle school health teacher. I've served as a uh, preschool, a fitness-based preschool director as well as teacher and also as an adjunct lecturer here at Hartwick in our PE and phys ed classes. Um, currently, my role on campus is really front-facing. I am the person who manages the Campbell Fitness Center and the 20 student staff that are part of that team, as well as having created the Peer Health Education Program on campus. And with those students and the interns, um, in a sense, I, get a, I, I feel like my expertise comes from uh, seeing students every day. Uh, the other thing is, is that with my office being on the fourth floor of Dewar and Campbell Fitness Center being on the ground floor of Dewar, not only do I get in a lot of steps every day, but I get to walk through and experience and observe students in their spaces, such as Stack Lounge, the Commons, and of course the Campbell Fitness Center. So I feel that with that sort of um, ability to observe every day in their spaces, uh, that it, it gives me a great deal of insight. Hi, I'm Addie Colligan. I am a senior political science and environmental sustainability double major with a legal studies minor. Um, I grew up in a really rural area in upstate New York. Um, and for the past five years, I've lived in an even more rural area in upstate New York. Um, and I'm a political science and environmental sustainability double major, so um, I think I've seen a lot of, of different aspects of the divide within the nation in general. And then obviously I'm a student, so I can see what goes on here. Good morning, I'm Kathleen Ash. I'm a nurse and a professor in the Department of Nursing here at Hartwick College. I'm honored to be on this panel today to celebrate the inauguration of President Riesberg. I believe I was selected to be on this panel for two reasons, perhaps. Um, one is I teach a junior level January term course called Rural Health Nursing, where we take a deep dive into the health belief and culture of the upstate New York rural population with the intent also of increasing students' cultural competency. And also I've been pra a practicing nurse at Bassett Medical Center in the Birthing Center since 1988 caring for rural women and their families. So I hope those two experiences give you some insight for today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jade Killikelly. I'm a junior public health major on the pre-medical track. I come from Jamaica, Queens, New York, and I'm captain of the tennis team here at Hartwick. <laughs> Thank you, Vice President, <laughs> Vice President of the Black Student Union, a senior resident assistant in Saxton Hall, a member of the Honors Program, and a peer health educator with Heidi. Um, I'm from a very urban area, so I believe I can speak to that experience, and I'm a student here, obviously. Great. Thank you all. So, our first question. How do the political and cultural differences between rural and urban communities show up across the country and on the Hartwick campus? Um, so it's kind of an acknowledged truism, right, that this urban-rural divide is new and based upon differing worldviews. Um, political, economic, environmental, cultural, all of these issues play into this divide, which has been growing over the last 20 years, um, to a level where scholars, Dr. Suzanne Mettler, for example, at Cornell has been studying this growing political divide for the last couple of years. And it's fairly clear and obvious through uh, popular discussion that there are different views. Um, support for the two major parties, issues on race, on policing, on abortion, guns, 
environmental policy, and you know, over the last couple of years, COVID responses and vaccines. So there is this divide, and at the same time, the, the Brookings Institution has come out with a paper explaining that our focus on this divide sometimes creates a dichotomy which uh, obscures the nuances and the overlap between these two areas. So it's a very, it's what we know popularly, uh, we get hidden all of that complexity. And that's why a college education matters, is because we can look at those things. You know, we've seen a large gap between how people in the two areas vote, and that didn't exist in the 80s and 90s, so we imagine that it's a new thing. Uh, you don't see the divide between the voters in President Reagan or President Clinton during that time that we see between President, President Trump and former President, uh, or former President Trump and President Biden. But there's long been serious differences between urban and rural areas. Going back, you know, the Constitutional Convention in 1787, uh, Governor Clinton in New York despised Alexander Hamilton, uh, Clinton being representing upstate New York, Hamilton representing the city. Jefferson had this view that there was going to be a, a um, rural utopia, and Hamilton believed that it was going to be urban centers that mattered in democracy. Um, William Jennings Bryan on the Democratic side rose because of his support among rural people and his promise that uh, um, he would support them. So there's been this long divide, right? And today's divide is exacerbated by issues of race, a shifting economy towards urban America, contention over the very meaning of the nation. What is democracy? How we as citizens should even act? You know, rural areas have an outsized impact on government today. For example, the Senate, 50 senators represent 40% of the country. Um, you have the Electoral College, which favors rural areas. Uh, and these divisions are also elevated because of social media, the tendency to simplify complex issues, and basically a harsh and demeaning rhetoric which dominates much of our popular culture. And it's, it's not new. In Federalist Number 1, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Federalist is, is, are the essays that defended the Constitution, the doctrine of the Constitution. Hamilton wrote, to judge from the conduct of the opposite parties, we shall be led to conclude that they will mutually hope to evince the justness of their opinions and to increase the number of their converts by the loudness of their declamations and by the bitterness of their invectives. You know, today we are consumed with loud declamations and bitter invectives. And uh, usually through sim simple statements from all sides. And democracy is much harder than just voting. It's much more complex. It requires engaging in the world through dialogue and action, respect, listening, learning, and being open to learning from people we disagree with. And at Hartwick, we have a rural campus with students who come up to this different world from the city, and we are, uh, as well as from rural areas. And we're a unique place. We combine a world-class education with listening, with engagement across viewpoints, with respect, with confronting major issues such as the urban-rural divide. And um, frankly, at Hartwick, one of the most unique things is that this intellectual environment is infused with a kindness that does not often exist in the modern world. Uh, and this is why I think we are perfectly suited to take on the many challenges of this modern world, such as that of the urban-rural divide, now under the leadership of our new president, President Riesberg. Uh, and students do this through their intellectual journey, of which we professors are just their guides. Um, and they do it, as I told her, we know I would mention, by joining things like the Student Government Association. <laughs> And we have wonderful people guiding students in addition to the faculty and the institution, uh, like my colleague next to me, the amazing Biyama Charles, who helps us to advance dialogue 
respect, and listening every day. So I think that's why we are able to confront this issue. I'm going to turn it over to Yama. Thank you, Jim. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about my vantage point from Hartwick College. Um, Jim spoke to you more about the overall country um, and that political divide. Um, for me, from my vantage points, both having worked in residential life and housing and now as the inaugural director for the office of DIB, which is what I will call it because it's a very long title. Um, many of our students um, who are from rural areas tend to silence their political views outside of the classroom. I think they are very engaged in classrooms like Laura, Dr. Laurel Elder and Jim. Um, but then I think once they're out of that space, they want to kind of fit in a little bit more. And so, um, in spaces, in some other spaces, we've seen um, our urban students having more of those dialogues that Jim mentioned, namely because there's this idea of protection in numbers. Um, and so we'll see a lot of our, our rural students kind of, you know, have quiet conversations on the side because they may come from more conservative households. Whereas here, being that um, Hartwick is usually viewed as a more liberal institution where um, democratic values are more in line with the, the majority, um, a lot of our students, you kind of see that divide in that way. What we do see instead is a turning towards social media as an outlet. And so we'll see someone post or repost a meme um, without much context, without much education or, or, or understanding of how that impact, what that can have on the larger majority of people who may see it. And so a lot of the conversations that we end up having have to deal with. So let's talk about why that was offensive to people who may have seen that. Um, and then also helping our urban students understand that everyone has the right to post what they like, whether we agree with it or not. It's helping them understand the impact of, of those, those posts. And also the fact that just because you post it and delete it doesn't mean someone like me hasn't already screenshotted it, so we now have evidence. So. I used to tell the RAs that all the time. <laughs> um, I think something that David Axelrod said yesterday was very um, pointed into that piece as well, in that views are affirmed but not always informed. And um, I think a lot of our students collectively have views, and rightly so, and, but sometimes, you know, because of their 18 years of being told one way, this is how we believe in our family, et cetera, now all of a sudden they're in this position to start to think and rethink about, hmm, do I really agree with that value? Do, do I really align with that way of thinking? And so um, I thought that was a, a really great quote to kind of connect that. Um, I think also symbols of aggression, oppression, um, that could potentially challenge one's safety are more visible to our urban students in an area like Oneonta. Um, most of the urban students know that the house across the street from the hospital has a Confederate flag that flies. Um, and so there's always this sense of, I really don't want to get sick and be brought there because there's this sense of proximity also. Um, I think there's also this piece for a lot of our students who grew up in rural areas, um, BB guns, knives that are carved by grandpa, those are all things that have more sentimental value as opposed to on a college campus where it may actually be viewed as a weapon. And so having those conversations in student conduct meetings um, about, yes, we appreciate that grandpa carved that knife for you. Here's why we can't really have that in the residence hall. So we're gonna confiscate that and give it back to you at the end of the year. Um, so I think also this, this sense of sentimental versus safety um, we don't usually find those things, you know, in, in urban rooms, you know, mostly we'll find things that create the sense of place, the sense of safety. So we might find things like microwaves, um, because I get to now cook a, you know, a meal that feels great, even though I'm not supposed to have this microwave. Um, <laughs> you know, I think there, it's just a very interesting thing when you kind of think about it, uh, quite literally. Um, and so, my office, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, our job, as Jim mentioned, is really to celebrate diversity in all of its forms, um, practice inclusion by providing initiatives, programs, 
workshops and trainings for the campus community to understand those differences within the divide and then hopefully bridge that um, all so that everyone can feel a sense of belonging. So that's what we're doing and we hope we're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you both. We have time for one or two follow on comments if anyone has something to respond to or add, although you're not required to. All right. Jade, how would you describe the life experiences, culture, and lifestyle of your urban peers on campus, and what is unique to people from urban settings? You know, I would say that the urban population here at Hartwick, excuse me, has more first-generation students, um, people of color, students from underperforming high schools, um, and low- and middle-income households. I believe that with these challenges, coming to a college in a rural area can be quite challenging. Um, looking around at the local neighborhood, you don't often see people that look like you, are willing to accept you, um, and it's a lot more slow-paced here as compared to in urban cities where life is much more fast. Um, I believe that urban students Excuse me, I'm coming down with a bit of a cold. <laughs> um, urban students have to work on and off campus to support their lifestyles here at college, and they often participate in things that can take away from their academics. As a senior RA in Saxton Hall, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to be able to bridge the gap with these students and connect them to the necessary resources in order to succeed. So the office of DIB um, the peer health system and other offices here at Hartwick, like the success coaches, tutoring offices such as those. And I believe that, on the other hand, these students are also typically motivated. Um, they dabble in everything on campus from athletics, like myself, in clubs and organizations that pertain to their interests. But I also believe, to answer the second part of the question, that students from urban settings are more connected. Um, this campus population has a lot of students from urban areas, so they're able to look around campus and find people from the same area as themselves and connect with them in that way. Thank you. Kathleen, how would you describe the life experiences, culture, and lifestyle of the rural people you work with professionally? What is unique to people from rural settings? So I'd like to start out answering this question by saying first, despite the challenges of rural life, that rural people, given the choice, choose to live in a rural setting versus an urban setting. And I'm sure that much of the audience that lives in this area would agree with that statement. Rural people are strongly bonded to each other and to their communities and to their beliefs. So when I speak about the challenges of rural living I, that I'm about to touch upon, rural people uh, view the advantages of rural living and the beauty of rural living preferable. So on to some challenges that, um, that I see that are common actually. Conveniences like a market with fresh food, a pharmacy, a dentist, a healthcare provider are not in every town and often are a long drive away for many rural people. Job prospects that have been shrinking in rural areas over the decades due to globalization and automation mean long commutes to find work. So there's lots of miles on rural people's cars, for sure. And that's just a reality. Social isolation is a problem in rural areas that goes across all the demographics. and. Um, rising poverty rates, rising addiction rates, rising obesity rates, increasing mental health diagnoses, decreasing life expectancy rates. This, these are all kind of negative, but they are the reality. And these are things that I see in my professional life. And also there are topics that we talk about in the rural health nursing class that I referred to in my opening statement. In that class, we discuss these topics, we read articles on these topics, we bring in guest expert speakers, and then 
the students come up with solutions, and that's kind of the magic of that class that makes it maybe my favorite one that I teach here. So to address what makes the rural setting unique, or I'm going to use a real life scenario from a healthcare perspective, which probably won't surprise you that that's what I chose, but um, to respond to that, what makes the rural life unique, setting unique for people is, um, I'm gonna use something from my professional life at the birthing center. Most of our patients travel an hour to have their baby, sometimes even further. And that's a long ways. And you may wonder why is that? In, since I've been at the birthing center, which I mentioned is 1988, I've seen four hospitals close or their birthing centers close. That would be in Little Falls Hospital in Herkimer, in Hamilton Community Hospital in Hamilton, New York, and right here, those of you from Oneonta, no, Fox closed there six years ago. So all those patients funnel to, to our, uh, into Bassett, into Cooperstown, which is uh, in you know, rural Osseo County, as many of you know, they're our clinical partner for our nursing students. So I know our nursing majors know. Um, the, according to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, 100 hospitals have closed in rural America since 2010. So what happens when we lose access to care, in particular for OB services? I should mention that in urban areas, there's been plenty of hospital closures and mergers as well. But it means for rural population, you're getting in the car and you're driving a distance to your prenatal appointment. So that's if you can have a car. That's if you can afford a car. That's if you can get transportation. What happens if you can't? Well, the social determinants of health happen. And these contribute to the disparities that we see every day in healthcare. And the negative outcomes for mothers and babies result. And a couple of these common examples of these negative outcomes simply put our premature birth and sicker mothers. So when I started practicing nursing at the birthing center in 1988, we did less than 400 deliveries a year. We're over 1,000 now in pretty much the same space, which is a whole other symposium, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was uncommon, you know, in general, mothers were pretty healthy, so our mothers aren't as healthy as they used to be due to some of those, those rising uh, dis you know, disparages of health that I mentioned. Uh, and we would maybe transfer a baby about once a month to Albany Medical Center. Now, as I said, we do over 1,000 births a year, and I checked our statistics yesterday, and we're up to 60 transfers out to date to a higher level of care for our newborns. So what makes that unique to, to a rural area? What it means is you have your baby and unexpectedly they need to be transferred to a higher level of care. This could be Albany, Binghamton, um, or Syracuse. So now that mother and baby are separated by at least an hour and a half distance. And I want to pose that as my example of something that makes rural life unique. Thank you. Does anyone have a follow-on comment, response? Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, I would like to talk about definitely that idea of what's available versus what's accessible. Um, I think that's also a challenge that a lot of our urban students find, like Jade mentioned before, um, that simple things like getting your hair done are not easy things to happen. Um, if you go to Walmart, you're kind of limited to a very small section of products that we can even use. Um, in terms of diversity of cuisines, like yes, we have different sorts of cuisines on Main Street, but when you're coming from an area where every single block <laughs> is like five different sorts of um, you know, diverse cuisines, it, it creates sometimes this impression of do I belong here? Is this really the experience that I want to have? And I will say that Hartwick, because of that family feel, that small feel, a lot of our urban students do say yes. It actually is a place that I feel like I belong. Um, and it's because of the interactions that they're having with each other that yes, things may not necessarily be accessible, but we do have offices on campus who will take us on trips or will bring a lot of those items here to help us 
have a better experience. So, thank you. Heidi, from your perspective as someone who interacts with all student groups on campus, can you describe where and how you see students from rural and urban backgrounds mixing or not mixing on campus? To what extent do students mix or self-segregate? Sure. Um, because I do kind of flow through those spaces a lot. Um, I actually see both. I've witnessed and experienced both. Um, I would say that one of the things that I've seen in recent years is in Stack Lounge, um, where you'll see sort of groups of students uh, in a space together, not really doing much except hanging out, but you can tell by just sort of like, you know, the way that they're listening to the music, um, you know, just kind of taking that first glance at them, that they're sort of like, pulling themselves together um, and kind of as Jade mentioned before to um, putting themselves in sort of their like group from familiarity. Uh, on the flip side, uh, the Campbell Fitness Center I feel like is a space where you see everyone mixing. It's sort of this uh, great equalizer where people are sharing a kindred spirit for needing to work out, um, for just being strong and fit, um, and also just you know, I, I see the Campbell Fitness Center and fitness is also a way for students to um, improve and enhance their mental health. Um, and when I think about the why, why is this happening? Why do students sometimes um, segregate um, into those like groups? Uh, the thing that really resonates with me from, from my perspective as the health and wellness person on campus is this whole idea of burnout. And it's something that I've spent a great deal of time in the past two and a half years really researching. And if you're not familiar with it, burnout is caused by prolonged stress. And it is a state of physical, emotional, and mental depletion unlike anything people have ever felt before. Um, it is, uh, when we think of this idea of prolonged stress and we think of a first year student coming to a campus community where all of a sudden they are responsible for everything all at once. You know, navigating course changes, um, navigating eating, navigating, you know, and now they live with a roommate, maybe they've never had a roommate before. Uh, so, so many things all at once. So it's definitely a time of increased stress. And so, you know, when you think about burnout, uh, one of the things I like to share is a little story to kind of explain what burnout is. I use this with our students on campus and it's called the make your bed story. <laughs> Um, the make your bed story goes like this. On a normal day when you are not burned out, your habit may be to get up and just make your bed. And you, it takes you 32 seconds. You pop out of bed, you make your bed, you don't think about it. When you're in a state of burnout, you wake up, you look at your bed, you talk to yourself in your head like, you know, I should make my bed. And, but uh, I just don't know if I have the energy to make my bed today. And I don't really feel motivated to make my bed today. And I'm just, I'm really tired. I don't even know if I want to get out of bed today. Um, and so I think, you know, helping people understand this idea of burnout, one of the things that we know about burnout is that when we are in that state or getting to a state of burnout, we want to very much go to what we know. We want to kind of tuck in to those safe spaces and be in light like groups and be where it is comfortable and it doesn't require a lot of energy. And so um, when I look at students when they want to group up and just hang out and listen to their music, you know, I'm thinking of it from that perspective. Um, and then, you know, we had to add COVID to our mix for college students. So that increased the rate of burnout for, for everyone, students, faculty, staff included. Um, and so as I, as I think about this and I think about us sort of moving forward and, and becoming a space uh, where we can sort of, um, uh, you know, as we've talked about so many in so many ways, being this this really cool, uh, unique liberal arts college that kind of helps to bring us all together. I, you know, I really like to think um, about putting uh, mental health at the forefront uh, of of as a way to bridge that divide of just remembering it's one of those great equalizers that regardless of where you're from, where you're coming from, where you've been, you know, if you're dealing with something of that nature. We're all the same, um, and we all need to sort of uh, learn some strategies, uh, resilience-based, to, to help overcome that and move through that. And so that's sort of uh, what I see and, and uh, what I think about. Thank you. Addie, from your perspective as a student, can you describe where and how you see students from rural and urban backgrounds mixing or not mixing on campus? Do they 
makes her self-segregate? Um, I think like everybody else has kind of said, we do tend to self-segregate. Um, I never really actually noticed this until I started thinking about it for the symposium. Um, but I definitely do like myself know that I have a lot more friends that are from rural areas than I do from urban areas, though like I do mix a little bit. Um, I think where you see it most, I feel like I see it most in like my, my political science classes because a lot of the people speaking are people who have more liberal ideas, um, and typically they are the urban kids, though there are some of us rural students who um, also share those um, ideals and morals. Um, and the, the rural students with more conservative views, I feel like, are the ones who don't speak as much, um, especially I'm in one class um, with Professor Chick, and I am the only woman in the class. Um, everyone else is a man. <laughs> and so um, anytime we're talking about like abortion or um, things like that, even more like, I guess, just liberal topics, I feel like there are certain students who don't um, speak as much. Um, and whenever the topic of abortion comes up, I am the only one to say anything. <laughs> um, and, and no one else, you know, has anything to say about it. Um, in international relations, um, post-2020 election with Professor Amy Forster Rothbart, um, a lot of us had very democratic views. Um, and there were only like one or two other students who like were conservative, so it is a, a very uh, liberal college, definitely, like um, Biyama was saying. And so I think that those are the places where I see it the most being different. Um, although, also like Heidi was saying in Stack, um, <laughs> there are people who the UC congregate and like playing their own music. Um, I feel like more urban kids hang out there. Maybe we just have more urban kids. Um, but that's more of the music that you will hear. Um, you don't really hear any country music playing <laughs> unless it's coming from the safety of your own room um, so that you don't get made fun of. Um, because I guarantee probably 80% of this campus would make fun of you if they knew you listened to country music. Um, my own roommates make fun of me. <laughs> so. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think I see it most in, in classes. Thank you. Any thoughts, responses, follow-ons? from? I, I wonder how the international students we have on campus fit in. I don't know, Heidi, if you or, or, you know, or whoever would want to respond to that. I can just speak from a Campbell Fitness Center perspective, and everybody's there. So <laughs> from that perspective, when you walk in, it's not just, you know, it's, it's so really from that perspective, um, you know, there's a nice mixture of people who want to have that common goal of enjoying the fitness center or just enjoying working out. So um, the, I think the international students really enjoy our National Recognition Days specifically because it helps them, again, begin to and continue learning about American culture. Um, and some, some of the, the observances that we also do help them connect back to their roots as well. So the most recent one we did was National German Day, and we do have an international student who, who is from Germany. And she would literally started jumping up and down when she saw like the pretzels, and then we was just like, it's, it's fine. Um, but you know, um, but then I think the, the most moving part of that, and, and um, Karen McGrath was there for this moment. One of our Asian students, visiting students, so she won't be here next year, um, she took a video of all of the German food that we had and sent it to a friend that she knew back home who was coming here to help them feel that sense of when you get here, they do things like this that will make you feel right at home. And so I was just like, I can't, like you can't make this up. This is great. Um, so I do think our international students are um, 
first usually to sign up for things. They love really learning about our culture, um, always going on our trips and, and things of that nature. So I, I definitely think they are um, part of the fabric of, of Hartwick in that way. Um, I guess from like a student's perspective, for international students, um, I think that Biyama is definitely right that like when we do international things, um, like recognition days, or just anything that has to do with like international things in general, um, like Model UN, um, uh, we have a lot of international students in Model UN, which I guess I wouldn't have expected, um, but it does make a lot of sense. The student from Germany is also in Model UN and loves it. Um, and I think they find safety and comfort within each other, knowing that they're all kind of coming from different places that like are, are extremely different from America. Um, I have heard some of them talking just like in Model UN or in the political science department or being around um, that there are some really big differences that I guess I never would have thought of and I'm sure other American students wouldn't ever have thought of. Um, but I think other students are also, um, like national students, are good at reaching out um, and trying to like bring them into different things, um, especially if they're part a part of a club and like trying to recruit new members. Um, but even if they're not, just like being super friendly um, and just very welcoming, um, which I think is something that that Hartwick students are pretty good at doing. I think also from the urban perspective and similarly mentioning what Biyama talked about when diversity puts on events that reach out to those students, um, Carnival last year was a big one. I believe the urban student population is very heavy in Caribbean and African students and being able to see their culture represented in such a way and being able to educate those who may not know as much about it is huge for them. All right, thank you. Do the differences that have been described in the discussion so far present any challenges to our living harmoniously on campus? How so and in what ways? <laughs> Professor Technik, you have just weighed out the silence. <laughs> Um, can you repeat the question? <laughs> also allowed. Do the differences that have been described so far present any challenges to our living harmoniously on campus? How so and in what ways? Okay, <laughs> yeah, so um, I actually, I got to speak with David Axelrod yesterday before his big conversation um, and I asked him about the divide um, nationally and one of the things that he was talking about um, was intolerance and I think that that is something that really does kind of keep us from coming together um, not even just like from a, a perspective of somebody being intolerant but from being somebody who has a lot of intolerance for that intolerance um, those are his words, not mine. <laughs> um, but I definitely, I don't think I've ever like thought about that. Um, but it, it, it is definitely true and it made me think about my own self um, and my intolerance for intolerance because <laughs> um, I think especially being a more liberal, rural person in America, um, I see a lot of people just with really outrageous views on certain things and I don't understand it. And um, it's the, the negative effects towards, that come from those views um, on other groups of people, minorities, just all across the world. Um, 
especially here when people have those views, it's, it's hard as a student to not say, okay, I'm not going to be your friend because I don't, I don't like that. Like, and I, I think that a lot of people see that. Like, if somebody's viewpoints do not line up with yours, you are not going to be their friend. And I think sometimes that's okay. Um, I think it makes sense. Um, but I think it happens at a, sometimes it's just too much because you're, you're taking opportunities and friendships away from yourself um, or you're just being overly critical of, of something little. But um, I think that really stood out to me. I think intolerance for intolerance is something that I think everybody has an issue with. After a silence like that, we're always grateful to the student who finally <laughs> chimes in. Thank you. Uh, what can we do as a community to reach mutual understanding, respect, and unity? Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is the whole idea of really good, proactive communication. <laughs> I think that's something that I try to um, teach the Campbell staff about, uh, peer health educators. We talk about this whole idea of being a proactive and really good communicator. And one of the things that I use a lot as an example is this whole idea of listening to understand. So you're not listening to create your response to the person, whatever they're saying. You're actually listening to understand what it is that they're saying. And that understanding, um, that when you listen to someone to understand, that does not mean you have to agree with them, but that you are just giving them the benefit of the doubt of hearing the words that they're saying and where that's coming from. And so, you know, one thing I like to do with students is to make them do a three minute listening activity where someone has to speak for three whole minutes and the other person has to listen, and not say anything. <laughs> Um, and I think that's sort of a really interesting, it, it gives me a very interesting perspective of what they're thinking about in the class. Uh, and I, I just think that um, it served me and it served some students very well to stop for a minute and think about what is this person really saying. Um, I would just add that I would take out unity from that. <laughs> Um, mutual understanding and respect and the problem what I mean by that is that 70 million people voted for Donald Trump 77 million people in this country voted for Joe Biden it's a divided country we're not going to agree on things so we can have mutual understanding respect we can have unity on campus as being respectful individuals but again going back to that Hamilton quote it's always been this way. That's the whole point of democracy. It's hard. It's not easy. We want some data point. We want some graph that's going to tell us how to fix things. And that's not what democracy is. Just voting. This is democracy right here. And that's the beauty of being at Hartwick. So it's hard and we're going to disagree and we should disagree. You should stand up and be proud of what you believe in and open to learning things because other people know things as well. I think also, for starters, we need to continue to have the conversations like the one that we're having today, but also continue to create the spaces for learning and to talk about things such as inclusion and awareness. I think it's also important to continue to provide mentorship for students, and they need to be able to see themselves in professionals around them. I'll just add to that, kind of tagging on Jay. The symposium increases everyone's knowledge about rural living, urban living, and so getting to know people and having an understanding and a spirit of non judgment is, I think, the way to go. Learn more about each other. In his opening section, Jim talked about engaging in the world and being open to learning, and I had a note like, how can we do that better? And, and we're starting to touch on that. Any, any quick thoughts on, as Jim said, we do that, how can we do that better? Being engaging in the world and being open to learning. I think in some ways we need to continue to sell ourselves and to point out that we are a very unique place that actually does that on a day-to-day -day basis through very difficult situations, bringing people who are uh, 
promising students to their intellectual, through their intellectual development. And so I, I think that's something that we all can be very proud of as a community. I, I think we can also model the behavior that we want to see. And so um, if we want our students to be open to learning from each other, from us, that we should also enter spaces willingly, not begrudgingly. Um, I know from me, for example, I try to get to as many of my colleagues' different events, whether it's in the museum or it's an art history um, presentations or recitals, you know, with the music department. Like, I, I try to make a point to be visible in those spaces so that way our students can see me modeling that as well. So I think we collectively, it's, it's the collective work of all of us to make sure that we're modeling the behaviors that we want to see. So perhaps we're done with this part? Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. Uh, we would like to open up the discussion to questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Cheryl Johnson and Kara Swartwood will be coming around with wireless microphones. Uh, when you're called on to ask a question, please wait until a mic reaches you uh, before speaking. We're streaming the event, as you were told at the beginning, and only what's said into the mic will be picked up for inclusion in that. Uh, also, people inside the theater may have trouble hearing you if you're not speaking into the mic. Just a note, we're feeling our way around a subject where there may be some sensitivity and potential for hurt feelings. While we do want to learn more about the broader issue and our relationship to it, please remember that this isn't set up as an adversarial event. So with that, uh, uh, some, uh, yeah, the, woman, the person in the orange at the back, I don't know my glasses, I can't tell who that is. Oh, it's Mark Wolf. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. So um, David Axelrod said something yesterday that struck me. Um, it was about respecting like, essential workers, Essen as respecting people who aren't here, who aren't getting a college education for whatever reason. And I'm just wondering how do we as a community work with people who are not part of this community for that reason? Because this, you know, historically, colleges and universities are there to prepare an elite. So how do we work with these, uh, these people in our broader community who are not part of this community? Because I think that's part of the equation with the urban-rural divide. I would say starting with humility. <laughs> There's still only 35% of this population, and that's the high mark of people that have a college degree. So you have 65% of the population out there making things happen ever on a day-to-day -day basis that don't have a college degree. And so we, we, in our, it's one of the things in classes I talk about, you know, we often at the college level we ask students to make an argument and defend that argument. I do not ask students to do that in my classes. I ask them to make an analysis because making an argument says there is a, a right and a wrong, as opposed to the nuance that we have in society. So we have to re recognize, I mean, until recently it was 30% and below that had a college education. So uh, I think we all should have a little bit of humility. Um, I don't really know, like, I don't, I don't think I have any ideas on, on really how to fix it, but I do think that it starts at a young age. I think it starts right when you're out of high school. Um, when some people are doing VOTAC programs um, or going to a two-year trade school and others are going to a four-year college at a liberal arts school. Um, coming from a very rural area, I know a lot of people who didn't go to college at all I know a lot of people who um, went to a two-year trade school or got their associates for something um, and are working construction or um, working for National Grid or something like that. Um, and there's a difference, I think, the like feeling of hierarchy that some people feel um, 
for going to a four-year college, especially people who go to like a big school um, or like an Ivy League university, I think. Um, I know a few people from my high school who went to Ivies. I know a few people who go to SUNY Oneonta. Um, and there's even a difference between people who go to a private college and a public college. Um, I think if you go to a private school from the outer perspective of, of other people or from SUNY people, like friends at SUNY that I know, um, Heartwake to them is like this private institution filled with a ton of rich kids who are um, just here because their parents made them and their parents have the money and we all pay $60,000 <laughs> for our tuition out of pocket every year. Um, and I think that's not true. So, I mean, I know that's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, I think just like doing more outreach, but I mean for Hartwick, um, itself. I think doing more stuff with SUNY Oneonta um, and working together more, having students interact more instead of just seeing each other at the bars <laughs> um, or seeing each other on Main Street. Um, like academic stuff um, I think would be a good way to kind of bridge that gap a little bit. Um, but I, I do agree with what David Axelrod said. Um, about how there there is a hierarchy, um, and we do look down on, um, you know, the essential workers in America. I think that was brought out definitely during COVID, like he said. But just in general, living in a rural area, um, you really do see it. So, I I just want to also add uh, just a quick shout out to our Greek students who. I think do an amazing job on a day-to-day, -day, especially those who live off campus, with the town-gown relationships, in cleaning up, you know, just the neighborhood regularly, you know, recognizing noise levels and stuff like that. More times than not, we have community members thank us for the, the great work that our Greek students are doing in comparison to SUNY sometimes. And so um, I think we also should acknowledge that, you know, we, in many cases are doing some of those smaller things to kind of show that we're being community partners as well. Um, I was gonna say, I think the dialogue you're having and the work that you're doing is so important. Probably many of you read an article that I read, I think it's been out in the last month, that the vast majority of college students today will not room with a person of a different political party and so I think that's just like an interesting thing. I don't know if you've seen it here yet or just want to respond to that kind of problem in the U.S. in general. Um, personally, for myself, I think that I would not room with um, someone from the opposite <laughs> political party. Um, all of my roommates right now are Democrats. Anytime I have ever tried to room with somebody who is a Republican, um, even if it was another woman, there were things that we just disagreed on that are so ingrained in our own moral um, compasses and in the way that we carry ourselves and hold ourselves and view other people. And I think it does stem from a little bit of intolerance um, or a lot of it. But I think that's something that like, you know, College is hard, and you're away from people you know, and when you first come in, you just want somebody who's going to make you feel like you're at home, so it's easier to just gravitate towards people that you um, fit in with more um, and that align with your values, and I think that's what a lot of people do. I think, that's, I think that that's a reason why there is a divide at Hartwick in general, because um, most people aren't very moderate, um, and a lot of people do just want to be friends with people who kind of accentuate their own views. 
And that's a societal thing too. I mean, it's going on at every level where families are disagreeing with each other, spousal disagreements that have gone up. All of these things have been studied for the last seven years and it's getting worse. And it's because if I'm a Democrat, I'm not looking at Republican ideas. If I'm a Republican, I'm not listening to Democratic ideas. And um, Axel Rod, since people like to be mentioning him, mentioned that last night. We're all in our own little chambers. And, um, and again, that is, I try and break away and chip away at that every day in class. Um, and it takes a long time. Uh, right? <laughs> so I'm Mark Jarnick, the mayor of the city of Oneonta. And I've been looking forward to this conversation since I first read about it. So I think somewhere in the middle of the divide of urban and rural is the city of Oneonta. We actually don't have property that's defined by acres here. Very little farming in the city of Oneonta. And I look at our, um, well, you know, honestly, my, um, my mission is recruitment and retention. And so I look at Oneonta as being potentially a laboratory for that urban, rural, divide to be worked out. And in order for that to happen, we need to have commonalities in places where, and, and, and opportunities for people to engage with one another and to be socially interactive. And I don't know that we have that. And so to this group and this group at any time that you'd ever like to get a hold of me, mayor at oneonta.ny.us, any ideas, first of all, of what we are doing right that allows the retention and recruitment of folks here at the campus, because we'd love to have you guys stay, and what can we do that will facilitate success? Thank you. Anybody? I guess I'll just go back to uh, the fact that you were elected mayor. This is what democracy is, right? This is a work in progress. This is something that we have to engage in these sorts of dialogues. We have to continue this. It's not easy. It's, um, and it's not Biden versus Trump, you know, 2.0 or whatever it happens in 2024. It's these local levels. It's what we're doing at Hartwick. We have the opportunity to do a lot of things you just said. And that's what democracy is, is engaging with each other it, trying to get over because like Addie said it's hard to deal with people if you agree that women should have the right to make their own medical choices it's hard to talk to somebody who thinks that abortion is murder right it's it's a really hard line to cross and again we don't listen to each other you know and we think that some sort of graph is going to tell us where to go and it's not because we're the most technologically savvy society that's ever lived and we're the most stressed out society that's ever lived. And we've got to deal with that. And I personally believe that is through democracy and that's more than voting, that is what we're doing today. So anyway, that's my own. My own thoughts is that, Mayor, you're doing the right thing. The Starbucks was a nice addition. <laughs> A, a, a concrete addition to that, I, I believe the, our Center for Grain is going in downtown, so more of that kind of practical hands-on connection so that while students are here, they're getting real-world experiences that involve them in the city and increase the chances that when they graduate, they've got some kind of tactile connection that makes them want to stay. Uh, somebody on this side? I, oh, well, can, I, can I also add, I think oh. um, increasing the types of housing options is going to be critical, um, especially now that we're competing in a society where remote and hybrid positions are giving people that flexibility to move to a Caribbean island for a year and work, you know, and still get paid the U.S. rate. Um, so I think people are looking and they're not really um, trying to compromise on, on some of those luxuries of just having a, a place to lay your head. Um, I will give a quick shout out to Residential Life, um, Dr. Colleen Budd, for allowing me to stay in the apartment that I was granted in my associate director role. Um, because truly, if I didn't have that, I really don't know where I would live in town as a single person. 
Um, again, a single black female in this town, it's not always the, the most comfortable in terms of safety. And so um, I'm forever grateful that I have that opportunity, but that's not the reality for a lot of people. So um, I think definitely looking at affordable housing options for people like myself. Um, I'd like to agree kind of with what Biama said about housing. Um, also just the uncomfortableness of being um, a minority in Oneonta. Um, maybe not the city, but the surrounding town um, and even more rural like outskirts. If you drive out, um, there are houses with Confederate flags like a lot, quite a lot. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Trump memorabilia. Um, I mean, there are, there are trucks that drive around with the Confederate flag on the back of them or on their license plate. Um, and even just like, even just as myself, I like, I am very aware of my white privilege in this town. Um, but like that scares me as a student, as a woman, um, and especially a young woman, I mean, being on a college campus in general is, you know, nerve wracking in itself. Um, but I think that, I think that's something good that we've been doing, um, in like the city in general, um, is how much the, the colleges interact with the, the city. Um, I love Hawkstown Fever. I love being able to see community members like come out and support us. And I, I love being able to like um, see kids go through and like play the games that we've brought in, like knowing that SGA is sponsoring some of that stuff, um, I think is amazing. And um, to be a student and be able to like see community members uh, is is really good because I mean even though I'm a senior and I have a car and I can go off campus whenever I want to I really don't that much I think a lot of us don't because there's not much to do in in Oneonta um, which I mean I love um, but yeah I think I think working with one another to to have those um, like big events is is a very good thing that we're doing I, I wanted to respond um, to the question. Uh, one thing that I found both my students and I r really grew from was working side by side with members of the community in all the various community organizations. Uh, I incorporated into my courses through community-based service learning. And we learned the most, so much, by working with Head Start at the shelter for families that are experiencing uh, family violence, the VIP program, um, the Boys and Girls Club in town, the feeding programs, um, the migrant tutorial program, and Job Corps. And we learned respect and uh, mutual understanding because we worked side by side with people responding to our community's needs. And I had my students walk the neighborhoods in Oneonta so that they would see where these places were and what neighborhoods looked like. And it was a very important thing for us all, community-based service learning. Hi, I'm Tori. I'm a junior here at Hartwick in the political science department. Um, and I wanted to respond to the question that's kind of been going around. And then I do have a question for you guys. Um, I come from the Midwest. I'm from Michigan, a very, very rural farm community. Um, and going back to rooming with people of different political parties, I've done it my whole life. I don't think I know a single Democrat in Southwest Michigan, they don't exist. It's just not a thing. And so I've had to be, as our swim coach would say, comfortable with being uncomfortable, being around people who don't have the same views as I do. And I've talked about it in Professor Elder's classes, Professor Boothman's classes. It's one of the things that has made me the person I am and has helped me understand my political values and want to go into political science. So I think there is some value in 
being uncomfortable and tolerating intolerance. Um, but my question is going back to the original point that Professor Boothman made about the gap. Um, and it's something that David Axelrod talked about yesterday. He had said that Trump won 80% of the counties in the United States, and a lot of those are rural counties. Um, and Democrats just don't reach out to rural areas anymore. There was not political campaigning done in the rural regions of Michigan or Indiana. And I'm just wondering if you think campaigning in rural areas like that for Democrats or just political campa campaigning in general would help bridge that gap between urban and rural areas. I guess that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard. I mean, you have gerrymandering, again, that Axelrod mentioned. We have, we have a lot of problems with the structure of our democracy, and those can be addressed. Uh, unfortunately, and for those of you who are a little um, beyond your college years, perhaps it's good to think of the fact that we often put so much on all of you you have to deal, you have to, you know, Tori, you're fixing climate change. Um, everyone in your generation gets all of this put on you and then we say, well, you know, they, they're this and they're that, and most of that is wrong. And it comes through memes on social media. So, but the reality is, as I said, you know, 50 senators which control what, how the Supreme Court went, that comes from, they represent 44% of this country. We have issues with the Electoral College. One of the frustrations and that we deal with in class when we talk about things is that uh, in order to change those things, you have to become educated. And unfortunately, in today's world, we think everything's going to come through our phone. And education takes time. It's hard. It's not easy, just like democracy. So. It's going to take a lot of work. And, and as far as campaigning, it's easy to see, right? Um, one of the reasons Hillary Clinton lost uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, was because she did not go there. She took those places for granted. And the Democrats have taken a lot of things for granted, and uh, including down to the local level, which has been funded on the Republican side since 1980. So the Republicans have focused very much. Republicans control two-thirds of the state legislatures in this country. They control 60%, I believe, of the governorships. And um, they focus on those areas. And that's where democracy happens, whoever wins the White House. Um, I have a question um, regarding um, those of you that, well, different perspectives up there, um, but in general, do you, pro you professional staff and stu staff members and students notice any stereotype, any stereotypes of perceived intelligence between rural and urban students, and does that affect um, the way that people interact um, and like um, have you know certain like again like perceived. Um, notions of like, and like, especially when you're going to teach students that are from different backgrounds, do you find it hard to overcome your own biases um, and associations because members of rural and um, um, urban communities t um, tend to have poverty and poverty also gets associated with um, someone's perceived intelligence. So I just wondered if anyone could speak to that. I'll take, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I take students to the hospital and teach them how to take care of patients. So the rural patients, so our whole student body of nursing students anyway that's pretty diverse, do need to figure out a way to communicate with impoverished, low intelligence patients sometimes and teach them how to bring their baby home or help them breastfeed. So I think the mentor, I, my the way I do that is show them how, bring them in the room, I'll show you first, you know, teach them how to do it, and then they find their way in their own way, which is really rewarding as a faculty member here to see them then 
being able to successfully interact with patients. And um, so I think it's through mentoring and showing them. Uh, the, I say, when I first meet all students, we're not judging our patients because you will see things that will make you question a lot of things. So I, I hope that answers your question a little bit. I would also just like to add in um, being uh, part of the peer health education group, I think is a really unique perspective because it's so many different students coming together, but with the ultimate goal of trying to reach out to the entire campus community. And so I find that that experience is really interesting because it creates a space where people can share their differences and from those differences actually be able to better reach out to more students on a prevention health education type of thing. So um, it actually works in our favor, so to speak. We have time for one more. Someone in front here. One of you were talking about um, how burnout affected how people interact with others and tend to congregate in familiar um, backgrounds. Does that explain why the urban and rural and people tend to trend towards traditional size, such as primarily rural people tend to go for the Republicans and vice versa. Is it to keep their mental health or keep their familiarity around them because they have to deal with sudden changes of dependency and their lifestyles? I do, I mean, I believe and have witnessed uh, with COVID being here, you know, when we went through all of that with campus um, and, and of course the aftermath of that, that yes, burnout was a, a very real thing um, and that burnout does make people want to gravitate to what they know um, because it's easier to process and manage and deal with. Um, and if I think about COVID too, um, for many of our students, COVID was traumatic. It was one of the very first traumatic events that they had to work with, deal with, work through. And trauma doesn't just go away. Um, trauma healing takes time. And I think that uh, it helps me to look at our students from that perspective um, of that, you know, sometimes if they are segregating or doing things in a, in, in a way that maybe I don't quite understand, I'm looking at it from that lens of they're working through their experience to, to come out whole. So as to whether or not it kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, what was the first part of your question? I want to make sure I get it right. But the, like keeping them, um, you know, rural versus um, urban per se. I'm not sure, you know, if that's exactly it. But I do think it plays a part. Yes, that was the answer. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have time for one more. Hi, um, my question, I think I want an answer from Biyama or Jade. Um, so you brought up social media earlier, Biyama, and my question is, how do you see that social media is utilized differently among rural and urban students? I think here at Hartwick, um, some of the examples that come to mind immediately, um, some of some of our rural students will repost something like a meme without much not even a caption sometimes it's just oh it looks great it's trending let me just post it just because it looks great um whereas our urban students who then see that meme now have made a generalization about the person who's posted it not really having the context of what they meant when they posted it because most times again there's no caption um, if it's on Snapchat, there's also that 24-hour window where it's also going to disappear. And so the person who usually posted things, oh, no one's going to see it. No big deal. Um, and then it's that one student who's already fired up because of something that happened in the world somewhere else. Um, they're already triggered. They're already experiencing that burnout. 
Um, there's the the institutional and kind of historical trauma that you know, especially people from marginalized groups already kind of walk the earth with. So now you have all of those things playing a role for a meme, you know, that wasn't necessarily intended for them, wasn't intended to make a sweeping statement about them, and maybe the the um, affinity group that they may represent. But suddenly now there's an incident. Now we have an, an incident that needs to be addressed because I'm angry that I saw this and this person is the devil and now I want nothing to do with them. And so similar to what Abby was saying earlier, that sense of um, I'm just not going to deal. I'm not talking to them. I, wanna, I don't want to see them in the comments. I want nothing to do with them. And so we have to kind of, again, enter stage left <laughs> in helping both sides understand just because you saw this thing, yes, you have the right to feel the way that you're feeling and the things that it's bringing up for you, but let's also look at the other side to that. And then also for the person who posted it, here's why this was triggering in a way that you may not have seen that becoming a trigger for someone. Um, and so the hope is that by the end of that, they both understand from both sides of the coin that there's an impact that can take place when you post. So the, we always say, not every, you don't have to post everything. Like, like <laughs> honestly, like, you know, we prefer that if you have a question about something that you see that is trending or whatever the case is, bring it to us. Let's make a program out of it and then we can all talk about it. Versus you kind of just doing these things and then, oh gosh, now I'm canceled because now we also know about the cancel culture, which is a whole nother symposium. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's that, education piece on both sides and, and hoping that they can see and kind of have a restorative justice moment from that and not completely pegging one person off or a whole group of people based on something that's posted, whether out of ignorance or simply because they just felt like it. And I think also to answer your question, social media can be used as an unintentional weapon. Um, Biama addressed people's intent versus their impact. And I think that's really big in when someone posts something that they may identify with or believe they don't intend to hurt another person, but they don't really understand how that person may see it and how it'll impact them. So I think just education on the whole and having these conversations is super important. Thank you for attending today's symposium. Uh, by my count, we've... Uh, launched two more, so now we're <laughs> in the hole a little bit. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this small down payment on the larger issue. Thanks also to Professor of Education Betsy Bloom and Assistant Professor of Sociology Cheryl Johnson. The three of us were the committee that helped put this together. <laughs> Thank you, of course, to our panelists for all your wonderful observations. Chris Spivak and the team with the usual high level of tech support. <laughs> Gail Glover and the inauguration committee for general support and uh, to the president for the initial topic suggestion. Lastly, uh, Professor Bloom and I had the privilege of being on the search committee that selected uh, Darren to be recommended to the board as the president. And I think I speak for Betsy when I say we, we have no regrets about that recommendation. So I'd like to thank the board for accepting our recommendation. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>